Uh, good morning. Uh, my talk is going to be a little bit different. Uh, I'm a composer of music and a uh, new professor of artistic research here. Um, I take a somewhat different approach to this. Um, basically, I'm going to talk about how I use research as a tool for artistic work and then how the artistic work sometimes influences scientific study of sound. Um, but first, I thought that I would talk about one piece that has a relation to the research I'm going to talk about uh, after this. Um, this is a piece called The Return of Taki, the Last Feral Horse. And uh, it uses different sorts of, I guess you can call it research, um, looking at bioacoustics of different animals, uh, from mammals to small birds, or, or large birds, as in the case of the eagle, horse, uh, deer, elk, reindeer, wolf, eagle, um, looking at their behaviors in the real world, uh, uh, territorial, grazing, herding, things of this nature, uh, particularly of the, of the, um, of the feral horse, uh, taki. So uh, feral means something that was once domesticated is now wild, again. And uh, this horse, uh, taki, was uh, feared to have been uh, extinct in the wild, um, it, it was reared again in uh, captivity and then released into the great Gobi Desert in Mongolia and also in parts of China. Um, this piece also uh, uses an ancient Mongolian poem, but, uh, but primarily the singer doesn't really use text in this piece. Um, also doing research on the, on the remnants of the Genghis Khan uh, 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 empire. Uh, this is his uh, great-grandson, Hulago Kun, uh, Khan, in the 13th century. And also I'm doing research, very intense research, into voice, brass, and winds, uh, uh, acoustics, uh, multidimensional decoupling things that we can talk about, um, if you wish. Um, also it has to do with the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, I use that in Mongolia. This was performed in, uh, in uh, China, by a load bang, which is a group from New York City. Um, so uh, there's a lot that goes into most of my compositions, but um, I thought I would just present really three simple things uh, and how they influenced. I'm, I'm not trying to make a direct metaphor. Some are closer than others, but basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the signals or the sounds of the wolf, the deer, and then of singing sand dunes. I don't know if you know about singing sand, but, but sound can sing, uh, sand can sing. And so I uh, have been influenced by these different phenomena in the pieces, and I thought I would play an example of the phenomena and then show how it might have an influence in the music. It's not to represent it necessarily, but... Uh, okay, so the sound of the wolf, we all know. Let's, let's hope this works. <laughs> Having some problems here with that. Okay, here's the wolf. Ah. Do we have sound? Um. Okay, so that's the sound of the wolf that we all know. Um, I don't know if I'm able to... Are you able to make the gain higher on, on the board? Okay. Okay, and here's an example of it in... Uh, our uh, influence of this in the music. And a lot louder. And here's the score underneath. And I should say, there's no processing of the sound at all. It's all live. There's no computers, no electronics or anything. And the next one is the roar of the Iberian red deer. And here we see an example of a nasal grunt at the beginning, uh, followed by a modal phonation, which is kind of normal voice for a deer, <laughs> uh, followed by a chaos, 
and then going into uh, again a mode change. It's kind of a normal voice, but at a at a higher mode, and then back into the chaos. And here's what that sounds like. And in particular, I really like that, that chaos, that, that very noisy sound, and I asked the singer to do something like that. He wasn't really quite able to reach what I wanted him to get with that. that <laughs> he wasn't able to quite get there, but um, okay, never mind. Here's an example. Louder. So that should be louder. Okie dokie. And then the next one are the shifting sands. And um, <laughs> there's a lot on YouTube about these. And I also did uh, a spectral analysis of one sample of, of the singing sand. Uh, but let me play you a fun video by a, f uh, a team of French researchers. It's, it's kind of cute. Yeah. So that's singing sand. So there are two thresholds. The amount of sand that's pushed. Four fingers. Three fingers. About the same. Two fingers. Considerably less sound, huh? Much weaker. And one. And one finger. Almost nothing. And the next one. Is speed. Too slow. No sound. A little bit stronger. Stronger and higher. Even stronger, even higher. And again. Um, and, <laughs> and, and it's really fascinating because also it's not just uh, somebody pushing the sound, but also the wind uh, uh, is able to produce it. And so different, different types of compositions of sand produce different sorts of singing sound. And it's really fascinating. Um, but that's not really what this talk is about. So but here's an example of, of the influence of singing sand. It's all the noise that we hear. Can go a little bit higher. So it's, um, it's all the noise in, in the signals. Uh, so instruments are doing things where they're playing and then making sounds with their faces or the voices at the same time while playing. And uh, you can see the multidimensional s uh, network here where I have uh, the, m the main pitch and rhythm stave with other staves, two or three or four staves with different information that they're supposed to make sounds while they're playing at the same time. Uh, and I thought that I would play uh, an excerpt, a five-minute excerpt of the piece. Uh, is that appropriate, do you think? Is it okay? Yeah, okay. Here's a short excerpt of the piece. Three excerpts, I think. Ah, good. Go higher.
I think I'm going to stop it here since that noise is really bothering me. <laughs> I'm not sure what the problem is here. Um, okay, I'll, I'll continue. Um, I'll just go on. So um, I'm involved with um, research into different elements of voice, linguistics, nonlinear dynamics of instruments and voices, chorus music theory, rhythmic complexity, multidimensional acoustical networks. Um, and I thought that I would talk about one particular thing that, that was used in the piece, which is something we're calling um, M M4. Uh, M3 is referred to as the whistle register, singing in the whistle register. Maybe some of you know that, the Pfeiffer Stimme. Uh, but M4 is something that is uh, a different sort of mode of singing. And um, it's, it's even higher than the whistle register, which is M3. And so we're calling that uh, the glottal whistle, or M4. And here we see the whistle register, which is basically the highest documented register. And um, we've actually have documents of it, and it's been published that the M4 is a different and higher mode of singing. But uh, let's go back to the uh, M3. So the first two are the s voices in the wh whistle register. So this is the uh, uh, a very famous example by Erna Sack uh, singing in the uh, whistle register. <laughs> Oh, that's the whistle register, M3. And the next one is uh, the Guinness World Book record holder, uh, Adam Lopez. He sang the pitch that's one key higher than the end of the piano. And this is the highest uh, recorded note ever sung until today. And it's a little bit sharp. It's a little bit heavy, this, this sound, so... Um. <coughs> That's C-sharp, and... <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, supposedly the, uh, the highest note ever sung. And so in terms of hertz, that's 4,565 hertz, okay? So it's very high, huh? It's even higher than the piano. Now check this one out. If you think that was high, look at my sister. So in case your ears didn't tell you that this was higher, it indeed is higher. So this one here is 6,500 hertz, so almost 2,000 higher. Let me say this again. It's not even close. It's not in the same ballpark. In terms of sports, this one is much higher than this one. I'm not hearing any woof. So in terms of the piano, that's like a perfect fifth on the piano. So it's like a G sharp. Oh! <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, and this is Demetrio Stratos, who was in the 1970s and 80s a famous rock star from Italy. If any of you know the rock band, uh, oh, I just forgot the name. They were a fusion progressive rock band coming out of like the, the Yes uh, Genesis mode, but more towards the jazz side. And he would break uh, in, an, uh, uh, in a stadium full of 80,000 people. He would stop doing this progressive jazz, rock, whatever stuff, and he would do uh, experimental voice things. Astonishing, this guy. So that's uh, Demetrio Stratos uh, at uh, 6,500 hertz. So the question is, what the hell is going? What the heck is going on here? And um, I did a study on uh, on the pitch profile, and we looked at 35 M4 samples. Uh, most of them were 26 women, seven men. Uh, pitch profile, most were between one and three kilohertz. I'll go through this quickly because maybe that's a little bit boring. The highest fundamental tone, the highest FO, was pr produced by a male. The lowest FO in, in this register was produced by a female. Uh, we make no claim favoring one gender over the other or, or anything. Uh, uh, these samples, 8, 14, 24, 39, are all higher than the highest note on the piano. Uh, and here's kind of a breakdown of the dif different distributions uh, and related to the keyboard. 
Um, the widest range, one singer had a range of 4,600 hertz. 4,600 hertz was the range of one singer. That's a lot. Uh, the narrowest one was uh, 100 hertz. So quite a difference. Um, I won't go through much of this. Uh, here are the different reported transitions between uh, the chest voice and the, and the head voice with the pin, uh, primo passaggio, or the secondo, uh, secondo passaggio between M2 and the higher M2, and then a, a transition between uh, M2 and M3. And then the reg uh, uh, it's an open question whether or not we could actually consider there to be a transition between the M3 and the M4. This is, this is an open question because is it using a different sort of, of, of way of oscillating? Because normally the vocal folds, when you sing, they close at the bottom, uh, close medially and then superiorly, then they snap open. And they close and snap open, close and snap open, close and snap open. And one idea that, that we published about uh, 17 years ago was that um, there's a vortex that's produced at the upper edges of the vocal folds to produce this whistle-like sound. Because if you think about your lips, <whistles> right? It's a vortex that's producing this, right? You don't really have an oscillation. Uh, you have a disturbance of air. And, uh, and is it proper or appropriate to say that the vocal folds are vibrating the whole time and maybe just vibrating at the upper edges uh, when they go into the M4 region here. So we did a study where the, the singer, she transitions from normal voice modal phonation up into M4 and I'll let you listen to it and make your decisions. Uh, actually that's not scientific, uh, but we have an idea, but we'll let you listen to it. And then So just to your ears, is it a smooth transition or not? No, of course not, right? It breaks, yeah. All right. Um, now, uh, uh, a cool thing about the glottal whistle is not just its range, but it's what we can do with it musically. So here's an example of Anna Homler who produces multiphonics uh, with the glottal whistle. So we have, uh, uh, we have one contour here that we're calling E and another one that we call G here. So here's the... E fundamental, and here's the second harmonic of that fundamental. But then we have a second tone in between that we're calling G. And so we have two tones here, then we have a third one entering here, and then here at the end we have a fry-like phonation that's added to this mix. So it's at least three components, if not four, at, at the very end, and I'll let you listen to that. Okay, so that's Anna Homer. Now here's the guy that we heard before, Demetrio Stratos. And here we have, it's really like a two voice counterpoint for those of you who know music. So you have F, which is the lower voice, G, which is the higher voice, and you see that they have contrary motion at times. And sometimes oblique motion, like this one here. And here G actually crosses F, and then crosses it again, and then a third time here, okay? So it's pretty cool, and it's amazing that this is coming out of one face. There's one voice, okay? Ah. Can any of you do this? Oh, come on, Karin, I know you can do it. Okay, now, he here's an important frame because uh, it's this idea that the vocal folds are not oscillating but producing a vortex at the upper edges calls, is called into question with this frame here because what we have is we have a normal tone here that's, that's fairly high, maybe M3, maybe uh, singing in the, in the whistle register, and here's the second harmonic here. But wait a minute. 
we have something else happening here. And actually, you, you'll hear it, right? And this sounds to us like it's this M4 thing. And you can hear the difference here. So it's kind of rough, it's kind of noisy, and then they couple here at the end. So it's very cool, but this then calls into question the, the whole thing because if, because if she has an M3 tone, then that, that implies that there is some level of oscillation of the vocal folds. So how can you oscillate and not oscillate at the same time, right? It could be oscillating in the front and it could be steady at the end, at the back end. So uh, uh, anterior, posterior, right? We don't know. But we have evidence that something else is happening here. Hear the noise? And then a couple at the end. And this is Angie who was here last week for the, for the uh, interferal one. Okay. Uh, okay, and then again, uh, the glottal whistle can be produced ingressively with the air going inwards or outwards. I'll do this quickly because I think we're running out of time. So that's on an inward breath, going inwards. This one's on an outward breath. You can hear it. So on and so forth. Now, um, shall I finish up by talking a little bit very quickly about the science? Um, so basically, this is a plot of the signal-to-noise ratio and the, uh, and the SPL, the pressure. And uh, basically, um, when we have a higher uh, signal-to-noise ratio, then we have a greater degree of vocal fold contact. Low SNR, low degree, is a lack of vocal fold contact. And um, the greens and the reds are the uh, whistle sounds, and you see that they're more, more or less congregate, congregated here, which implies less of vocal fold contact. This one obviously has uh, more than the one at zero. So uh, at zero implies no vocal fold contact there. Um, so M4 is mostly in that lower left quadrant. Um, which supports the argument that it's non-oscillatory. Um, we did a study at the, at the UKM in Malaysia, and we had uh, two singers uh, go there, uh, and we uh, 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 used high-speed high endoscopy, also with EGG, which is a measure, oh, so endoscopy is either through the mouth or through the nose, which is looking, getting visual information about how the vocal folds oscillate. Uh, the EGG are two sensors placed on either side of the vocal folds, which measures the degree of closure and when. Uh, um, so, uh, but it's not conclusive what we found. But we do have examples here. This is, this is a sound uh, spectrograph, and uh, here is a normal tone, and here is the M4. And let me, uh, and so you see that there's a, 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 a signal all the way through. And um, we won't look at the acoustics here, but what I want to focus on is here. This is the EGG signal. And at this point here, right when, the, right when the glottal whistle begins, we see here at the bottom, there's no oscillation of the vocal folds at this point. So with this particular example, this M4 was produced without oscillation. But, um, but we've, uh, we were, <laughs> uh, this was in Malaysia and the equipment, it was at a university, not a hospital, and the equipment wasn't really well maintained, so we, we had some problems with the, with the technical aspects and we couldn't actually publish this data yet. Uh, this is one of the projects that we'll try to do here. <laughs> so uh, oscillation or not, uh, I'll just, cut to the end, it, uh, it seems that, yes, some are using, some M4 are using uh, 
no oscillation while some M4 seem to be using oscillation. So there seems to be a continuum of vocal fold behavior, and this is part of the study that we'll, uh, we'll look at uh, in the next years here, uh, or at the hospitals in Lund. So uh, thanks. <laughs>